Remember long ago the debtors' prisons of the past. In India, I remember the account of one situation where a farmer was in great debt to the local moneylender, the old man who had been lending money for years, a wealthy man, and it was time now for that moneylender to call in that debt. But the farmer couldn't pay it. So the moneylender went down to the farm and he was there walking on the path up to the farm. The, the farmer and his daughter saw him and greeted him and the moneylender demanded payment and the farmer didn't have it. So the moneylender said, I tell you what, I fancy your daughter. You give me your daughter in payment of the debt and it'll be wiped away. Both the daughter and the farmer were horrified at this old moneylender's proposal. And the moneylender, of course, could see this in their faces. So he says, I tell you what, we'll leave it up to Providence. He had a little bag. And he says, I'm going to take a couple of pebbles from this path here, a black one and a white one, and I'm going to put them in the bag. I'll let your daughter put her hand in and select which one she gets. If she gets the black pebble, I get to marry her and I'll wipe away your debt. If she gets the white pebble, I won't marry her, but I'll still wipe away your debt. Now, how's that for a deal? Well, there wasn't much in terms of options because the next option was you don't pay, you don't play, you go to jail. So the old moneylender bends down and he picks up two pebbles, but the daughter happened to notice he put two black pebbles in the bag. Now the situation's worse. What would you do? The young girl decides to save her father and she puts her hand in the bag. She pulls out a pebble and then accidentally, on purpose, she drops the pebble and it's now lost on the path. She says, oh, I'm so clumsy, I'm sorry. Well, just pull out the other one and then we'll know what the one I dropped was. And of course, he was too ashamed to admit that he was a cheat. And so she and her father escape. Clever. Today, Jesus teaches us about the clever steward. In fact, in the parable, he even compliments him for his cleverness. In this case, he's corrupt. He's corrupt, right? He's been cheating his master, okay? And after he cheats the master, the master finally is on to him. So he says, you know, prepare your, the account books because you're going to be let go. Now, today that wouldn't happen. Today they'd say, give me your keys in 15 minutes. Wrap up everything and get out of this office, right? You can't touch the computer anymore. Everything's shutting down. But in that day, they give you a little while to prepare your accounts, show it to the master, try and explain yourself. And he realizes he's in deep trouble. So he goes to the people who owe the master and starts cutting their accounts. So they're going to like him. Now they're all cheats, right? They're just as dishonest as he is. They're all cheats. And in the end, the master compliments him for his devilishness. What is the teaching for us in this parable? Obviously, our Lord is not wanting us to be cheats. How many times does he preach against theft and money being our false god, right? Which certainly could be our, one of our national obsessions. No, the message Jesus is giving us is that if the children of the kingdom of God were as clever as the children of this world are at their own goods and devices, we would be much farther along in building up a kingdom of grace. Now let's look at the situation we're in. So last night, I don't know how many hundred were killed in a mall in Kenya. At the same time, early in the morning, 60 some odd Christians were killed in a church in Pakistan. And earlier this week, a dozen Americans were killed at the Navy Yard. 
And every week we can go on and on and on and we're sort of numb to it. We're sort of like that proverbial frog in the crock pot. When the, the heat is just slowly rising, the frog thinks, oh, this is fabulous. I'm at a resort. I'm having a lovely bath here in the hot tub. And it just keeps rising and rising and rising until he's boiled to death. And that, dear friends, is what's happening in our world. We are collapsing. We're being boiled to death very slowly. We're numb so that they kill people on a Navy base or an Army base or an air base. They kill people in malls. They kill people in churches. And we just keep going on as though nothing's happening. The alert, the siren, seems to be dead. And yet the evil should be deafening to us. Under the veneer of Christianity, there is a war going on. And most people don't even see it. Wake up! What does St. Paul say to the Christians in his letter to Timothy? He says supplication, prayer, petition must be offered by everyone and for everyone. We've got to wake up. We've got to see what's going on. Or we will fall like the rest of history into the hands of the enemy. If you knew that an enemy were coming to your house tonight, what would you do? Wouldn't you bar the doors? Wouldn't you prepare yourself? Well, the enemy is already in your house. Do you know how? Handhelds. Think about it. Your children and your grandchildren are being invaded by handhelds. All kinds of electronic devices. When they get home from school, before you get home from work, and nobody's looking, the enemy is in your house. When you go to bed and you think they're asleep and they turn on their devices, the enemy is in your house. It's in their bedroom. How many of our children are already getting hooked on pornography while you're sleeping and you don't even know it? How many of our homes are being invaded by violent games? And then we have people with mental problems that are going into malls and going into churches and going onto bases, going into public and shooting and killing people with the availability we have of guns. And worse kind of weapons. I wouldn't be surprised if next it's the poison gases that are used in public. Are we simply uh, asleep? Now, the war is very apparent to me, and I pray God it's apparent to you. So what do you do? We need a plan. Paul makes it very clear. The early Christians knew there was a war going on. There was a battle for souls. And so he commanded them to pray. Pray always, in fact, he said. People tell me they're too busy. Do you pray in the morning? No, I, just, I get up, go to work. Now you know that there's going to be a battle. Don't pretend there is no battle going on. The battle is 24-7. So when you get up, the first thing you need to do, before you turn on your electronics or your TV or your radio, the first thing you need to do is get into prayer. The minimum, you need 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes at night. That's the minimum. If you're not praying every day, not just on Sunday, I have no idea how you're going to survive what's about to happen to this planet. I have no idea how you're going to survive. We cannot survive the battle if we don't prepare. Ask anybody in the military. Ask an athlete. Do you think an athlete's going to be able to be a champion without exercising every day, not just once a week? It's impossible. The athlete must stretch before running. You and I must pray. That's our stretching. That's our spiritual stretching. We've got to begin with the morning offering. We've got to dedicate the day to God. We've got to seek God. Otherwise, you're going to be filled with lies and deception, and you'll fall for it. 
like they did with the Holy Father. They took an interview of our Holy Father with a Jesuit magazine, Civita, from Italy. And they took highlights out of context as though he were not a defender of life or marriage. It's absurd. Read the whole article in americamagazine.org. You can read the whole thing. The very next day, as they suggest he wants to de-emphasize the dignity of human life, he's speaking to a conference of doctors, International Federation of Catholic Doctors. Quote, he says, this was Friday, although by their nature they are at the service of life, the health professionals are sometimes induced to disregard life itself. Instead, as we remember from the encyclical Caritas in Veritate, openness to life is at the center of true development. There is no true development without this openness to life." Unquote. The Holy Father begins to then speak about our culture of waste. We're treating life as though it were a waste product. You heard that in the letter, in the prophet rather, Amos, in the first reading where we were treating people as though they were the refuse of wheat. The refuse. Do you get it? This is what is going on. And so you're going to fall for the deceiver. You're going to be trapped by the liar. The enemy will have you in the palm of his hand if you're not awake. So the first thing I commend to you is prayer. Prayer personally, prayer individually, prayer as a family. Number two, study to be approved, the scriptures tell us. You've got to study the situation. Don't just take what you're, they're feeding you, the lies and deceptions. That means you have to study the word of God. Take a little bit of scripture with your family every day. There's truth. That's what Paul says. I'm not lying to you. This is the truth. And we will only be set free if we study and know the truth and know the person who is truth, Jesus Christ. That's the second part. So we have to pray, we have to study, and then we have to act. Clearly, when we act on what we know to be true and good, there will be new life. Now, I'm going to tell you about Charlemagne's granddaughter, the great Emperor Charlemagne. Around the year 800, he has this wonderful granddaughter, Ida, a beautiful girl. She's married to the, the Duke in the court. They have a child, and then the Duke dies. So now she's a widow at a young age. What does everybody want her to do? Remarry. Nope. Instead, she gets a coffin, puts it in her room, an empty coffin. And you might say, oh, she's lost her mind. She's grieving so much for her husband, all she wants to do is die. Nope. What she does with that coffin is every day she collects alms for the poor, food, whatever it is, fills up the coffin. The next day, she takes it out of the coffin and feeds the hungry. Then she does it again, fill up the coffin. Next day, bring it to the hungry. You see what she was doing? She had her mind on eternity. Because as the saying, the ancient saying goes, in this world, the rich can help the poor. In the next world, the poor can help the rich. Because it is the poor that we have helped. It's the only thing we can bring to heaven is charity, right? Our love for God and neighbor. It is the poor who will say, yes, yes, Lord, this is the one that gave me food. This is the one that gave me drink. This is the one that helped me find shelter. This is the one. They're the only ones that can defend us in the next life. The rich in this life can help the poor, but only the poor in the next life can help the rich. And so that's number three. Our action plan is to help those in need. And they're all kinds of poor. They're spiritually poor. They're materially poor. They're emotionally poor. There are people that are lonely, abandoned. We have got to do our action plan. In other words, we have to make Jesus known and loved, not only by our prayer, 
not only by our study, but by our action. And so, the war increases, and we better get awake. And so I conclude with a prayer for discernment. O Lord, open our ears to your word, even when we'd rather not listen to it, because it challenges us more than we want to be challenged. Lord, open our minds to your word, even when we'd rather not think about it, because it disturbs us more than we want to be disturbed. Lord, help us put your word into practice, even when we'd rather not act on it, because it means changing what we'd rather not change. Above all, Lord, help us realize that you never ask us to do anything that you won't bless beyond our wildest imagination. For you are never outdone in generosity. Amen.